Okay, we're back. Uh, this is Climate Finance and the Carbon Markets, a podcast originating out of the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. Uh, the class is uh, ENVR 6090D, and um, this is sponsored by the Division of Environment and Sustainability. Today, we are again with my esteemed colleague, Steph Russo. Hi, Steph. Hi, everyone. Um, today, we're going to talk uh, sort of in a continuation from our conversation uh, in the last podcast around uh, where we discussed the sort of the overarching mechanisms, the international agreements, uh, international institutions, and the way things work at the around climate change policy. We're going to dive a little bit deeper into um, carbon finance and policy, the carbon taxes and, and cap and trade systems around the world. Um, Stephanie is going to is great to, to talk to about this because she spent a, a quite a bit of her career, as you might recall from our earlier introduction, uh, in government uh, thinking about um, the markets, environmental markets generally, and, and carbon markets in particular. So we're going to dig a bit deeper into the Australian system because that's where her background is. But first, I want to give uh, folks an overview of uh, sort of how this all works. You know, we've, so we know just by by way of review that um, you know climate change is a problem. That uh, one way to deal with it is to put a price on carbon, and the two ways of dealing with that is to one do a carbon tax, and the other is to have put in place a carbon uh, cap and trade system. Uh, uh, and then we have the third item, which is kind of the voluntary carbon markets, and we'll talk about that in a later in a later class. So, Steph, um, if you don't mind, can you give us sort of that uh, you know thumbnail sketch or elevator uh, uh, talk about what a carbon tax is? Sure. Um, so, I guess the key difference between a carbon tax and a cap and trade system, and I think that's a good way to think about it. The carbon tax sets a price on a unit of carbon. Um, Whereas in a cap and trade system, generally, the price on carbon is set by the market. And so what you do in a carbon tax system is you set a price that you would like people to pay um, for that unit. And that's what governs the trading and what occurs within that system. In a cap and trade system, which you'll probably ask me a question about how they work in a minute, Charles, um, that's largely set by um, the market itself in terms of what people are willing to, to pay for that. But a carbon tax um, one of the benefits or disadvantages sometimes that come from that system is you lock in a price there and then people adjust their behaviour to what that um, price is. You need to make sure that you're setting that tax price at a level that either is kind of decup forcing decarbonising, decarbonisation or kind of incentivizing people to actually invest. So if you set that too low, um, obviously that becomes a disincentive for people to and companies to adjust their behavior. And if you set it too high, then it has the opposite impact. So there's a, a bit more, um, uh, I mean, if, you, if you're really good at, at uh, changing taxes, and we know politicians are not particularly good at this because they, you know, this does, you know, once somebody starts to rely on, on a tax rate, that's harder to change. Um, if you're really, if you're really good at that, you know, the carbon tax is pretty efficient, right? You can kind of move it up to disincentivize behavior and, and move it down when, when, when you don't need to do that anymore. Uh, but the, on the, on, as a contrast that, that cap and trade market really relies on the, the, the market itself to set the price. So describe a little bit about the, go deeper on the cap and trade side. Tell, tell us a little bit about how that mechanically works, you know, Somebody gets an allowance, you know, auctions. How does that all play out? Yeah, so at its base, um, and I guess, you know, cap and trade gives you a, a hint about how it would work, but there's an overall allowance that's set in the system. So that's what your cap is. That's the maximum amount of emissions that can be produced by either it can be set at a kind of whole of economy scale, can be set capturing only certain sectors. So there might be an overall emissions allowance for, say, manufacturing or for energy production. And that's the kind of all at the company level. And what happens is if you're above that allowance, you need to find a way to bring your kind of um, operations back below that level. And so there will be other people who are either, um, you know, undertaking projects that might sequester carbon or are under their allowances. And what you can do is you can then trade with them. So you might say, I'm a heavy polluter. I'm not going to fit within the allowance that I have. 
I need to go and buy the additional units to allow me to meet kind of sit within that compliance um, mechanism. And then there's different ways to do those trades. So they can be, you know, either through an auction process and they're often governed or kind of controlled by governments, um, or you can have an open market where you might have a trading platform um, and those sorts of things. So there's a number of different ways that you can do those trades and some secondary markets that might sit in there. So you might have a kind of predominantly government governed auction process but then there's the ability to then also sell that on to second part um, kind of additional parties. And there's a number of different ways in countries that use different mechanisms. And in a place um, like Europe, which has got, which we'll talk about in a second, which has, you know, sort of decided, let's get a handle on carbon. Let's start to knock, knock down, you know, the, the emissions of carbon here in this, in this, in this region. Um, they start to look at things from a you know big sectoral perspective. What are the big sectors that you you know if you're if you're China if you're Europe, uh, California or others that have these cap and trade systems? What are you looking for? Uh, who, who's who do you go after first? Well, generally, energy production is the so um, anyone who's producing electricity through non-renewable sources is probably where you first start. In most economies, they are you know, the largest contributor to overall emissions. Um, then you might look at manufacturing. So there's a number of kind of in the, the, the manufacturing space, people who I guess have high levels of electricity consumption or, um, you know, have limited options to decarbonize. but in general, those kind of heavy emitters in that space. Um, and then kind of shipping and aviation, I think are the other two that often get um, captured and they're captured within the EU system. Um, the EU ETS, I was looking at this before, covers about 40% of all emissions in the sectors that they've chosen. So they don't cover absolutely everything. Um, and one of the sectors that is always a bit of a challenging space, and I know in Australia, um, you know, there's quite a lot of ideology behind it, is how you capture land use and agriculture in particular, because agriculture can be both a very large source of emissions, but also is a really large opportunity to then be able to kind of reduce overall emissions because of the land mass that um, is under that kind of private land and control. Um, and But not many people have really started to capture agriculture as a sector within their um, cap and trade systems yet. So it will be interesting to see what happens in that space. So, and, so that, and that's just sort of, um, it's almost a function of, uh, of uh, um, convenience as much as anything, uh, you know, uh, to 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 grab these big emitters that they're really easy to identify one so that's convenient but it's also efficient right it's an efficient way of of saying okay well these guys are actually making stuff electricity that everybody uses and so ultimately if we if we tax them they're going to have to raise the the you know they're going to have to either get more efficient or if we if we put them in a cap and trade system they're going to have to get more efficient uh, and and then ratcheting down every year or else they're going to have to charge more to the customers, right? Or or, or both, right? That is that that the general yeah. gist. And often they're the sectors which can, when I say can't, I guess afford to participate in these sorts of schemes. Um, you know, it is really built around. And Charles, you'll be familiar with this. I guess we both have an environmental background, but it's that kind of polluter pays principle. Of mm. these are the the industries and the sectors that are most benefiting financially from being able to. Um, kind of have uncontrolled emissions going into the atmosphere and mostly, you know, responsible for climate change. Um, and so they're the sectors that you start with and the sectors that you focus on. Um, and they're also the areas that have options. Um, they're the sectors that do have some options to decarbonize or also can start to channel money into, you know, conservation or land use or renewable energies, those sorts of things to start to offset those emissions. So this is sort of an example of uh, uh, you know, driving people through in, in the in the cap and trade system, driving people to kind of these uh, uh, what the economists call Pareto efficiencies uh, through cozy and bargaining, right? Is that the <laughs> to use a bunch of fancy words? Um, but that's really a, like it's a great example of that, right? It's it's you're really driving people towards uh, you know efficient efficiencies. Uh, and reductions. What, what are the so so we the Europeans capture um, uh, you know the coal fired power plants obviously. Um, what um, what do they give allowances out 
what, what do they give the allowances based upon? How do they decide that so and so gets you know a hundred units and other somebody else gets two hundred and 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 so on? Is it what, what's the background for that? Yeah, so my understanding, and definitely not an expert in the EU system, is that they look at the contribution of that particular sector to. So each country, when we covered this, I guess in one of the previous sessions, now has a nationally determined contribution, and so countries or within the EU, they have a kind of emissions reduction target that they set for the region. And then they look at the contributions of particular sectors and particular companies into meeting that overall target. So there's a lot of kind of modelling and emissions modelling and economic modelling that goes into sitting behind that. But it's roughly looking at, you know, what is their contribution to overall emissions um, what is the potential and where do, where do we want that sector to get to? So to meet that overall target, how much does that sector need to reduce over time? How large is that company's kind of contribution within that sector? Um, and also taking into account things like what is the opportunity for them to decarbonize the pathway and the time frame? And then that starts to um, be set in limits for kind of individual companies. Um, hmm. If we compare that, say, to Australia, just quickly as an aside, we have a safeguards mechanism and Australia doesn't have the most efficient um, carbon system, but their only um, emitters above a certain threshold end up being captured. It's a very, very small com um, component of the way that the Australian system works and they're the very heaviest emitters. Most people don't get captured by that safeguard mechanism. So they set a threshold you need to be above that threshold. And then once you're above that threshold, you have a target set on you. But yeah. the EU, they kind of capture them at the sectoral level. So sort of country, sectoral, and then individual emitters, like a coal plant gets an, an individual allowance. A company, let's call it, you know, let's say a coal plant's owned, owned by a single, you know, a company. That company gets essentially an assigned allowance that they're, they have to, you know, they have to emit within or else go out into the market and buy and buy uh, um, uh, credits from somebody else, essentially. What, yeah, um, and at the <clears throat> company, yeah, generally at the kind of company level. So it's basically, it's kind of looking at things at the status quo or their historical levels of emissions and saying, well, here's where we are today. Um, and uh, we know we want, at, at this level, we know we want to get to this level in five years and to you know a, a much reduced level by 2050, for example. And so this is the way we have to step that down uh, to drive that kind of efficiency. What yeah. is it, what, what, what causes sort of the pushbacks and the kickbacks on the, those sorts of systems? I, I, you can imagine there might be a lot of anxiety, uh, you know, um, when uh, uh, in Europe right now, for instance, it's, uh, you know, the Russians are about to go to war in the Ukraine, the, all the oil comes, or the gas comes through these countries. Um, you know, it's winter time. Uh, in the meantime, the, you know, global petroleum prices have gone through the roof. Uh, and so what, um, how do you, how do, how, what's the sort of, uh, uh, you know, how do people deal with those things? How do the regulators, how do the managers of these systems deal with those kind of external uh, stresses? Uh, I would say differently, probably. I mean, Australia is an example of where that pressure, particularly, I think, some fear that was very deliberately and kind of politically charged um, and, and ideological around, you know, those costs of a carbon tax being passed on to consumers, you know, and that scares people into looking at their, you know, um, power bills and what's that what will that mean for me? So if this sector is captured, you know, my electricity bills are going to go up 40% and I can't afford to pay 40% more um, in my electricity bills. So there's some of those kind of factors um, that come into play about how the um, any costs that are incurred by those companies will be passed down or passed through to the consumer. And one of the interesting things that the EU is now thinking about is how they deal with any goods that are imported into the EU, so how they deal with exporting countries to make sure that those goods um, have a kind of, they call it the carbon border adjustment mechanism. So obviously goods that are produced within the EU are captured by the EU ETFs to the extent that they're in one of these kind of manufacturing sectors, but people outside aren't, and that leads to a difference in the costs of those goods and what that might mean for consumers. 
And so they're thinking about how do they make sure that, um, you know, in an attempt to maintain the cost competitiveness of things that are in the EU, um, produced in the EU, as well as meeting greenhouse gas kind of targets, they're not then just kind of importing goods from somewhere else um, and allowing those countries not to reduce their emissions. So I think it looks the kind of main considerations are about what does this mean for the cost of goods and the economic efficiency of some of these sectors, and particularly when you're looking at how things pass kind of within a system and externally to that system. And that's, you know, why they've set an EU-based system rather than just individual country targets, because there's an efficiency in being able to do that at that, that regional level. And you, you mentioned a little bit about the sort of the interplay between the kind of the you know, external realities and the politics and the, and the sort of the way things are portrayed. Most economists say essentially that you know, even a fairly hefty carbon tax per ton doesn't really actually trickle down to much impact, you know, when you and I go to the store, or fill up the tank or, or hopefully plug the car in, uh, in terms of, of the costs, but it, it generally gets uh, tagged with that. And generally the, the carbon taxes or cap and trade systems generally get blamed for rising energy prices, even though, for instance, petroleum is now at 90, 90 bucks a barrel when it was at, you know, 20 or something uh, uh, last year at this time. Um, probably a, likely that 4x you know price rise for petroleum in the last year has more to do with rising uh, heating costs in Britain than uh, than the than the UK uh, cap and trade system. W- what do you think that's coming from? Why has has the how, why have these um, uh, carbon taxes and cap and trade uh, systems become so charged politically? Well, I mean, if you were a very uh... I guess, performing very well financially as a business and someone came along um, and said, we're going to change how you need to do your business. Um, People don't take too kindly to that, I guess, is that at its kind of base level, what's charging that? I mean, in Australia, as an example, um, the resources sector is an extremely powerful lobby group Um, Mm. and the Mineral Minerals Council of Australia is kind of one of the peak and kind of most politically influential um, representative bodies. Um, They, you know, spend a huge amount on political campaigning and those sorts of things and also have been fundamentally and very important for a long time to the Australian economy that has been largely resource-based. So resources, a bit of ag and services is kind of what what Australia looks like. Um, But I think it is about, you know, these are government systems it's a policy driven market and so people like with any other policy try to influence um political discussions and you know public discussions and discourse particularly in the lead up to elections around trying to get the most favorable policies for their business or company to operate in and um, it's not really that different to i guess any kind of other issues um but that is a a campaign that has worked quite well it's been very effective in driving um, or putting Australian kind of climate policy back many decades, I think. Um, We had a carbon tax in Australia. I think that it was not particularly well consulted on. People didn't understand how it would work and that creates space for misinformation to come in and to kind of change the way the debate plays out. How how did the, tell us a little bit about the history of the, of the Australian uh, carbon tax and, and then the creation of, um, of some of the other mechanisms now that Australia uses to, to, uh, to try to address climate change. Sure. So Australia had a carbon tax that was introduced. Um, Many people say that was kind of the beginning of a really ideological debate playing out in Australia between we have two major parties in Australia. We have um, our Liberal Party, which is the Conservative Party, um, and our Labor government, um, and very, very different views on the way that climate change should be addressed to the point that um, after the carbon tax was introduced, um, there was a change in government and that legislation Um, was removed and and policy substantially changed. And for a period of about six years, no one could even say climate change within government. People talked about climate variability. Um, There was, you know, a kind of political 
lack of will to believe that climate change existed. It's not unique to Australia. I think we saw that kind of playing out globally. Um, and so that meant that there were very different strategies that people and government needed to put in place to start to kind of address um, climate change. And one of them was, and that gave rise to a thing that was called direct action, I guess, in Australia. So rather than using a market-based mechanism like a cap and trade system or a carbon tax to put program funding, so kind of government um, grants, into particular projects that would reduce emissions or directly into renewable energy or particular sectors that they wanted to promote, rather than looking at it from a whole of economy kind of policy perspective. And so what that looked like is, you know, um, billions of dollars going into grants, particularly into the land sector, um, with government as the main purchaser of those carbon credits, um, and they manage that system. And one of the challenges with that is it's taken a long time for corporates um, to see how they participate in a system like that because it's been is predominantly there, there, kind of run and ACU? governed by government. Is yeah. there, there's an ACU system? Okay. Yeah. yeah. To explain yeah. a little bit about that. So that came up in the mid to 2015 ish or so. Is that when the. I'm trying ACU? to. Remember, yeah, around that period of time. So basically, the, the core of the system isn't that different um, to other places in the sense that there are particular ways you can generate a carbon credit. So there are particular methodologies. So you can plant trees, you can manage your farm differently, you can put in renewable energy, although that's kind of getting phased out as a way to produce those credits. And for every tonne of carbon that is either um, kind of avoided being put into the atmosphere or removed, you get one um, carbon credit. And, and that's, I guess, the base of most of these systems. What's a bit different in the Australian system is that the government through the clean energy regulator is the one who manages that system. And so what they do is people register their projects and they say, yes, you do or don't meet those methodologies and you're issued with these carbon credits. And it's mm. when it comes to the buyers for those carbon credits that it becomes a little bit kind of challenging. And so the predominant buyer in Australia is still, although it's changing, the Australian government. Um, mm. And they buy that through a reverse auction process um, and they have a budget that they're given with, within the government to purchase um, carbon credits. There is a small additional mechanism, which is the safeguard mechanism, as I mentioned, which is kind of like a mini cap and trade system. And so for heavy emitting sectors that are captured by that, and it's not many, I can't remember the number of companies captured, it's in the tens, not the hundreds or thousands of companies captured by that. Um, they are then required to purchase Australian carbon credit units to bring their emissions down below the cap that they've been set. But um, it has been predominantly the Australian government. And now we're seeing with corporate interest, there's been a lot, lot of purchasing that's beginning to happen um, by corporates voluntarily, but they're not captured by the government system. Gotcha. Okay. No, that, that, that's super helpful. Um, the so it's 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 quite a bit different. I mean, it's not really a cap system to except for a few tens of companies. It's more. It looks a little bit more like the voluntary carbon market, where you know essentially people are out there doing stuff that's gonna you know replace dirty energy or grab uh, grab carbon out of the air or um, uh, prevent carbon from being emitted from from natural sources. Uh, you know, so so it's. And then generating credits through through sets of methodologies, but what's different, I guess, between the voluntary market and the and the um, the uh, the Australian market, it's, it was it's kicked off at least initially, and and sounds like still significantly uh, by government, um, and uh, and is funded predominantly by government. Will will there? What's what's happened in the last couple of years around uh, ACUs? What's the what's the acronym stand for? Let's if we're trying Australian to Australian Carbon Credit Units. Accus. Excellent. Accus. What's happened in the, in the ACU market in the last uh, couple of years what, and why? Yeah, so I would say if we look back kind of 18 months, two years ago, the ACU price was probably around on average $17 a credit, a unit. Um, and Australian. it's an Australian, Australian, yeah, I should say Australian dollars. Don't know the the tr yeah. the translation, um, the conversion. 
Um, and it's now trading at around $50. We've seen trades that that's not the average, but we're starting to see some trades that are happening in the 50 Australian dollars um, a unit. Part of, there's a few kind of dynamics at play, largely, I think, and mostly driven by additional demand coming in from corporates who have made voluntary carbon um, emissions reduction and net zero commitments, and also an undersupply of projects into the system. So, you know, at $17 a unit, it's not particularly financially viable for all sectors to be um, developing projects and selling their carbon credit units. But when you start to look at the kind of $50 a unit, you start to see more players coming into the market and it starts to become financially kind of viable. If you compare that, say, to our neighbours in New Zealand, they have quite a different system. They do have a cap and trade system. Um, it's actually one of the, like land is extremely expensive in New Zealand. And one of the things that's been driving that is their, their, the price on carbon that they have. And so that's now becoming a viable land use and kind of um, economic use of land for farmers within New Zealand. Um, mm. And so there's quite a lot of supply that's coming in, an, in, um, in New Zealand. So in Australia, I think it's the combination of both um, demand and emerging additional demand and also supply. And I think people are starting to see or, you know, hoping that the government will take a, a more ambitious approach approach to um, climate action. You know, our current government announced net zero by 2050. I think there's no plan of how to get there. Um, so people are wondering what that's going to look like um, and when that might hit them. So, Well, for the, the cynics among us, and, and uh, Steph and I are definitely not the cynics among us, at least not in public, uh, you know, that seems to be the pattern, right, globally. is like, let's announce some fantastic goal off, off in the distant future uh, because those politicians who are announcing won't, won't be around to, uh, to, to, to show up uh, and say, oh, we, we, we made it happen uh, when it comes to 2050. So there is some danger here that, that the politics overrides this. But you've got some remarkable um, leadership, I think, in the corporate sector in in uh, in Australia, right? I mean, it, it, even some of the sort of former or current minerals um, tycoons and uh, entrepreneurs have be, have kind of gotten religion around carbon. Uh, and and is, is, does that have a? Who are those folks? Who are who are your big corporate leadership there that that can maybe driving some of that opinion at the government level? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the I guess, good things that has happened is it's created a space for other people to become engaged in climate change. So it's not just a, I guess, a government um, issue. Corporates are starting to really step up in Australia. Um, you know, as an example, uh, Big Four, we have kind of four major financial institutions and they're all coming out with really strong policies about not lending to kind of new um, thermal coal or, you know, the level of lending that they will um, make to the gas sector. And um, because they don't want to be seen to be supporting financially and lending to fossil fuels and heavy emitters. Um, and that's a really powerful tool because people need to be able to borrow money to build new um, power stations or, you know, gas pipelines, those sorts of things. Um, so we have that happening. We also have... Um, so Atlassian, who are a really large kind of tech company in, in Australia, they have a very strong and very vocal CEO who very regularly kind of critiques the Australian government and is trying to kind of get a backing of another of kind of probably a younger audience of people to be engaged in, in those conversations. And we're also starting to see a split in some sectors. So, you know, there are a number of... Um, kind of vocal supporters within the farming sector, farming, farmers themselves, who are wow. really wanting to see climate action because, you know, we've suffered extreme droughts, um, fires, floods. We're really feeling the tangible impacts of climate change in Australia. Um, but that doesn't necessarily always align with, you know, we have the Nationals Party who, in theory, represent the view of farmers. Doesn't always seem to be super kind of well aligned there. But we are starting to see much stronger kind of corporate engagement um, 
in these issues, either they're being pushed by consumers, they think it's the right thing to do, or, you know, particularly in the case of financial institutions, they're thinking about stranded assets. Um, and it's not a good investment for them long term, they, they sorts of um, things. So it all sorts of starts to work together and, and maybe even reverse what looked like a uh, kind of irreparably backward step uh, for Australia uh, five or six years ago now is looking actually kind of um, like these systems are coming into place. The corporate sectors, you know, being supportive, the government is having to, to, you know, whether they've been dragged to the table or what, or whatever, they're actually at the table in, in, uh, in Glasgow and, and uh, forced to make a set of, uh, you know, at least articulate um, a timeline. Uh, so it's so just not very efficient, I think is efficient yeah. or sustain sustainable in the sense of kind of longevity of a system that, you know, if you have a system built around the government having to pay for um, and buy through grants all of their emissions reductions, that's one, very expensive, and it's also very inefficient. And, you know, when that money starts to run out, people think what's happening to this system, it creates a lot of policy uncertainty, which is very different when you look at, you know, what's happening with the EU and what's happened to their prices over time and the stability that some of those systems provide. I think that's something that people are looking for kind of in Australia. Like, what is this really going to look like and how long is this going to be in place so we can learn the kind of rules of the game and figure out what that means for us? Well, I, th I think that's right. And I think what's interesting too is people will be watching the European Union as they're stressed this winter and, and through the um, sort of the, the rising energy prices, watching sort of whether they have the um, kind of the wherewithal and the strength to, to kind of adapt their way through and, and maintain their system and continue to, to ratchet um, ratchet down the allowances and ratchet down the emissions. Uh, the, the Australian example is, is sort of a, you know, a little more chaotic, but, but also headed, you know, headed seemingly in the right way. The Americans, um, it's kind of an odd experiment, right? Uh, there's just no, there's a lot of talk out of the US and very little action. Uh, the California system and the what's called the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative in northeastern U.S. are really the only two examples of, of either a tax or a, or a um, uh, cap and trade system uh, in in the U.S. and neither are supported by the U.S. the the federal government. So the the states in the U.S. have, have had to go it alone. Um, and there's a few more that are climbing on board, which is uh, and, and 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 contemplating moving forward with uh, cap and trade systems. I think Washington and Oregon, uh, and maybe maybe one other. So, you know, the the uh, th these are all kind of ongoing experiments um, and subject to a lot of uh, what you call policy uncertainty, or, which is caused by kind of political instability or political uh, you know considerations. Um, and I think it's it's always wise to kind of keep in mind that you know the best plan of an economist. Uh, you know, the highest efficiency outcomes uh, can generally can't get uh, generated if it has to go through a political process, right? You end up with something that's not quite as good as it should be. <laughs> yeah, and I think, you know, some of the critique of the Australian carbon tax when it came out was that some very, very incredibly intelligent economists had spent a long time designing this system and they hadn't necessarily brought other people along on that journey. And I think that's something that's, you know, I guess the ratcheting that, you know, they have in the EU ETS, it's also one of the fundamental mechanisms in the Paris Agreement of you kind of increase your ambition over time. There's also a kind of human behavioural element to that of we'll introduce something and, and we'll flag that it's going to increase or kind of reduce over time and we're going to tighten this as we go along the way. But it brings people along on that journey with you rather than saying, you know, we design this perfect thing and go, great, you all now to kind of need to participate in that um, because, you know, it does impact on and we're trying to, I guess, influence people's behaviour. Um, so, uh, Charles, I was going to ask you a question, if I'm allowed to yes. do that, about Please. what system you like the best. You know, you're obviously <laughs> thinking about these things and, you know, is there a particular kind of national or regional approach that you think you look at and go, oh, that's an interesting way to do that or that? feels like it'll be effective, I don't know, interested in your view. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to argue with the European system, um, especially as they've been able to withstand some political challenges to it. 
um, it, it's it's just it's very compelling to to have that level of you know I think you mentioned earlier on the um, <clears throat> the sort of market system that allows for the price to rise and fall depending upon the you know the the, um, the you know the, the you know all the factors in the market right um, supply demand uh, you know efficiency gains etc so I mean you can that's a hard place to 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 improve on <clears throat> at least you know in terms of um, the, the, the perfect system, you know, it's always tempting to have, um, you know, the, the economists will say, well, you know, we just have to, you know, have a, a, a carbon tax that's somehow indexed uh, and, and responsive to, to, you know, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And, and it goes up when there are more and there it goes down when there's not, but the problem is the implementation of that. So it's, it's the this sort of, the perfect world doesn't exist. Uh, so I'm pretty compelled by the, um, by the European system. Um, Korea has had, and, and New Zealand and Korea, I think are a couple of examples of, of these, these cap and trade systems in relative, you know, Korea's a bit bigger, New Zealand's a little smaller, but uh, you, you know, not huge economies, but that have, have worked for, you know, been working for a while. And, and I think they've got sort of the general gist of it. Um, uh, you know, the, the California system, similarly, California is kind of an interesting example because it's actually um, combined with a uh, Canadian province uh, with Quebec. So, so there you have two geographies who basically have almost nothing to do with each other. Uh, you know, they're opposite sides of the continent. Um, and they basically have the same regulatory system, the same, you know, capture the same types of industries, the same number of industries, set the same kind of pricing, uh, that they're tradable back and forth across the geographies. Um, so that that's it's a pretty interesting experiment. And you know, I think there's a lot of uh, a lot of work has been has gone into that, uh, into that system. So I think that's also worth worth some some further thought. Yeah, it's interesting. I was looking into the New Zealand system because um, they have a they have like price guard guardrails that the government sets. So they set a kind of floor price for their auction. So they have a cap and trade system, but then they have this auction floor price, which is the minimum that a kind of New Zealand unit will be sold for. And then they also have this contingency reserve where if the price gets too high, then they add additional supply in to kind of keep the, the price within particular parameters. It'll be really interesting to see how that works, the kind of New Zealand price has gone up quite a lot over time, but they're obviously thinking about, you know, if you do have this cap and trade system, how do you keep some price certainty for people who want to participate? Right. Um, right. Which is, you know, I don't know if others have that in the mechanisms that they're using, but I thought that was a kind of interesting feature. And maybe that is something you can do in a smaller kind of country and economy like New Zealand. I don't know how you roll that out on a kind of larger scale, but it feels like people are starting to think about kind of some innovative or creative kind of mechanisms around the, the outside of a base kind of ETS um, system um, to, to deal with some of the nervousness that people might have or, yeah. or how that might operate. Yeah. No, the, the European system has, has a similar kind of, um, uh, so I guess they call, I can't remember what it's called, a circuit breaker or a, uh, emergency mechanism, something along the lines of where if the price gets just too out there, it, it um, you know, the, the, they can make essentially a decision to cap or add additional supply or, or, or the like. So you have to, have to kind of, you have to maintain uh, um, a, uh, a little bit of discretion in these systems because you can't just unleash some perfect economic monster on the world and hope that it works. You, I think you have to kind of watch it pretty closely. Well, thank you so much, Steph. I think we've run a little bit over, uh, but it's always good to talk to you uh, in this podcast as as outside. Um, and uh, we'll wrap up today's version of climate finance and the carbon markets. Thank you, Steph Russo, for your time. And thanks for uh, having me. Yeah, my our pleasure. We'll get. Well, I'm sure I'll drag you back into it. Thanks so much. <laughs>